So welcome everyone to today's webinar on phishing scams, staying safe online. We are pleased to host this webinar in collaboration with Connected Canadians and the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. Before we begin, I would like to provide our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we gather on the traditional territory of a number of First Nations and acknowledge their stewardship of this land throughout the ages. We seek a new relationship with the original peoples of this land, one that is based in honor and deep respect. Just a few um, minor housekeeping items. Uh, as you know, in most of our webinars, the microphones are muted. However, we do encourage people to post uh, comments in the chat box, um, share information if you um, have that as it relates to the, uh, the topic today. If you have a specific question for our speaker, um, please post that in the Q&A box as we go along. And we will uh, take those questions up at the end. Uh, Benedict Chevron from the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse will be doing the Q&A at the end of the session. Um, so you can either, uh, we encourage you to put it in the Q&A. If you put it in the chat box, sometimes we, we miss the question. So uh, we might do a little reminder if you do accidentally put it in the chat box. As I mentioned, we have our ASL interpreters with us today. Uh, you can uh, pin the interpreter on your screen or make them larger by either pulling the screen across to make the images larger, um, or you can change the grid view at the very top of your screen. There's a little grid and you can change the view um, of just the speaker or uh, how it suits your own needs. As with all sessions, we do appreciate feedback at the end of the, the uh, webinar today. Um, at the end, you'll see a pop-up that comes up after the screen. If you take a couple minutes just to give your feedback, and then we will also be sending out an email with the link to the recording um, of the session with also the link to the survey if you didn't have a chance to fill it out today. We will try our best to get the recording and any materials that are posted in the chat box of links uh, up on our website probably by early next week. Um, and uh, you'll be able to ac access those at either Elder Abuse Prevention, Ontario's website, or the Canadian Network website. And we do appreciate that um, sometimes individuals may have some personal circumstances that they need to address. Um, we would encourage you to reach out to our organizations privately, either by email or you can call us. Our contact information will be available at the end of the session. This is a public forum, so we do appreciate keeping your confidentiality um, in regards to those, uh, those issues that you might want to um, have or have more discussion around. So um, we encourage you to keep questions more in a general sense, but it, we do, if you are having some difficulty or challenges, please reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to assist you. And just a little bit about our organizations. Um, so Elder Abuse Ontario, Prevention Ontario, our, our mission really is to make sure that seniors um, have a strong voice, are safe and respected in Ontario. We are um, responsible for implementing Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse, and that is under the Ministry for Seniors and Accessibility. And with that strategy, we have three main pillars of work that we work, that we deliver services and um, education under. So the first pillar is public education awareness. So we do a lot of um, awareness on public um, campaigns such as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day that's coming up. Our social media channels are very busy and we do many of these educational webinars as well as some in-person um, senior presentations as well. We do training for frontline staff in all sectors and we work with our community partners to coordinate services um, to, to increase the response uh, um, across Ontario for those who are encountering um, issues of vulnerability or at risk of abuse. I'm going to ask Benedict to talk a little bit about her organization. Hi, everybody. Nice to see you again. Uh, I recognize some names in the in the chat box already. 
Uh, if you don't know me, I'm the executive director of CNPEA, which is the Canadian Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse. Uh, we are the only pan-Canadian network in the country that is uh, focused on the prevention of elder abuse, neglect, and now we also um, add ageism to the list since it's such an important um, topic and it has such a strong connection with elder abuse prevention. So we work to improve awareness, to improve supports, and to improve capacity across the country so we can have a better coordinated approach to elder abuse and neglect. And we do this through knowledge mobilization, collaboration with organizations such as EAPO or Connected Canadians today, as well as policy reform and public education. Um, I'm very happy to be here. As uh, Rayanne mentioned earlier, I'll be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A box, and I'll be reading out a few of your questions at the end of the day. All right, Rayanne, back to you. Thank you. So Grace uh, gives us great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Jesse Smith. He is the Accessibility and Dementia Lead, uh, Technology Monitor Instructor at Connected Canadians. Uh, he has done a lot of work, if you can see from his bio, which was posted on the website as well as, as here. Uh, he's done a lot of work around education. So he's an educator and hospitality profession for over 20 years. Um, of client-facing experiences. He holds a master's in religious studies in theology and is currently completing a PhD in theology. He is currently joining us today from New Brunswick. Um, so he is, uh, he can maybe speak a little bit more further in his role with Connected Canadians and uh, uh, the diversity of education that he is providing. So I am going to turn uh, the presentation over to Jesse now. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> I am in fact, Jesse. And just so that you're aware of who we Connected Canadians are, at, are as an organization, we're a national charity that provides technology training and support to older Canadians. And we do this through a variety of ways, including one-on-one -on -one sessions with volunteer mentors, through workshops similar to the one you're experiencing now, uh, and even sometimes partnerships with groups like community centers or uh, retirement communities, sometimes where we actually will provide devices to them to help people get the most out of technology. Because oftentimes different devices or different programs don't come with manuals. And so knowing what you can do, what the possibilities are, are really, um, it's up to you to figure that out or for us to help you. So today I'm going to be talking about phishing scams. And this is something that often makes people hesitant to do things online. There's a tendency to think that there's a world out there that, that's a little frightening. And I believe that you want to be able to develop competence as well as confidence. So by the end of the session today, I hope that you understand what uh, a phishing scam is and that you also are able to avoid them. And knowing you have the power to avoid them just should give you more confidence in your daily online or technological interactions. So as we go through this, I will be sharing uh, a slideshow with you. And at the end, we will have a chance to discuss uh, and I'll be answering the questions that you have as we go forward. So when it comes to avoiding scam emails and messages, the best way you can do that is by taking your time to ask yourself some questions before you act. And that sounds easier than it is because one of the most common things to phishing scams like this is that they create a sense of urgency in you. So you want to make the quick decision, but we're going to sort of understand how to not do that. So the question, first of all, is what is phishing really? And then we'll look at how to recognize it, how he, you can report it, and then some tips and tricks to protect yourself in the future. So phishing itself, and that's with the PH phishing, in case any of you are not able to see the slides right now, this is a portmanteau of phony 
and fishing. And the phony part is that there's some sort of impersonating uh, going on. And the fishing is for you. <laughs> you are the, the catch, if you will. And the goal of fishing is to steal either your identity or money by extracting private information from you online. Now, personal information can mean a lot of things. Some of the more obvious ones could be your email address, banking login information, perhaps social media account logins and passwords, um, or financial things more explicitly like your credit card and CVV, uh, your driver's license number, your social insurance number, and sometimes even questions that might seem a bit innocuous like, oh, your mother's maiden name or the name of the high school you went to, or the name of your first pet. Because often those kinds of questions are used as sort of password challenges or, or personal information challenges to, let's say, you lose your password and you want to prove who you are. Questions like that also fall under this rubric of personal information. So getting any of those things out of you is the goal of a phishing attack. And I lump phishing in with a lot of different scams. And one of the things or one of the places you will encounter these messages the most is in your email inbox. But they're not always there or not only there. And they're different from other kinds of junk mail. Uh, so just as a note, the newsletter that you get from Best Buy because you signed up for a coupon once, that sends that gets you three or four emails every day that might be junk mail but it's not malicious and so some of the things that end up in your spam filter uh, or junk email account are actually malicious they count as phishing attacks so there's sort of two different categories that can get lumped in and i just want to note that because uh, some of these some things you might receive as junk are harmless and others are less so now, the way phishing works is by first sending you a legitimate sounding email or text message. And it's intended in that leg legitimate seeming email to instill some fear or sympathy, perhaps that fake sense of urgency I was mentioning, and then often demands or requests to click a link or download a program to help resolve the issue. <clears throat> Spoiler alert. It's not really an issue, <laughs> but the idea is that they want to get you to click or interact with, uh, with a thing, because once that happens, once the link is clicked or a program is downloaded, very often your computer or maybe a website in particular could be compromised. And here's an example of what that would look like when you receive uh, a text message that's a scam alert. So it says, Netflix alert, your monthly payment failed, resulting in the suspension. Note the suspension in all caps of your account on March 16th. To avoid suspension and additional charges, please confirm and update your card details here. So this is pushing the buttons of A, financial concern, that uh, something could be wrong with your card, and B, uh, the idea that your account will be canceled, so you'll lose access to something if you don't actually click on this. But uh, dig a little bit deeper and you start to realize once you take a breath that things might be a little bit off. And that's because some of the things that you can look for in this email involve things like, well, let's look at that again. You can see some of the capitalization is off. It's sporadic. Some words are all caps, some are not. Netflix, in one case, is actually misspelled. It's Netflix, <laughs> which, uh, which I assure you is sort of not how, that, that's not a legitimate thing anywhere. I hope none of you are paying for a subscription to Netflix. Um, but those sorts of things you can find in lots of places. Now, if you were to click on that link, that's the kind of thing that very often would send your information to someone else. 
And even if you felt a little panicked when you saw that, when you get anything like this, the important thing to remember is that taking a moment to investigate is the, the best thing you can do with any message you are not expecting. And that's a, that's a good way to think about it. Anything you're not expecting should give you pause. Even if you, let's say, ordered a package from Amazon, even if you bank with TD, if you get a message from TD that you're not expecting, that's something that should give you pause and you should take a moment to investigate. What you can do then to, to look into this is never click on email links and never download a program file in your email. So stop, don't do those things, don't click on links and don't download a program. And then once you've stopped and realized what you shouldn't do, here's some of the things that you can do. What I have here is an example of an email that was sent that is in fact a phishing attempt. And there are some things about this that look natural and could perhaps uh, fool someone into thinking that this was a legitimate email. Uh, it looks like a subscription confirmation coming from Apple for an application that costs, well, it's a little confusing. It looks like you're paying $11.13 but, oh, it's a subscription and it will renew every month. And the price once it renews is $38.23. Well, it says $38.23 in one place, but then it also says it will renew at $36.19. One way or the other, this email could make you think that you have signed up for something. Or my gosh, I, so as an example, my parents um, sometimes worry and fear that their grandkids, my kids, you know, what if they got a hold of the remote? What if, uh, what if one of the grandkids got the iPad and did something and all of a sudden it's going to cost me money? I didn't sign up for this, but what if somebody did? That sort of fear is exactly what can be found in an email like this. But as you look at it, the things that you start to see, the things that you can recognize in this start to look like, well, this list right here. This was an email that comes from an email that's not actually an Apple one. And major brands care quite deeply about what the email address, what the, the address is that they have. So Apple Computers keeps apple.com and guards it jealously. So the, the, the fact that this is supposed to be an Apple email, but it's not coming from apple.com is a big red flag. In fact, the email address references Microsoft, which is a competitor. And Apple orders like this come from a known address. Also, the sent to email address is not actually mine in this case. It's just going to service at Apple ID. So some things start to feel suspicious right when you look at who it's from and who it's to. Another thing that you would notice if you were to hover over links, is that what looks like a legitimate link don't go to where they're saying they, they go to. And this is the trick that if you don't know this already, I hope you hold on to. When you are interacting with a computer, so a laptop or a desktop, if there is a link, a hyperlink, so something that's underlined, like what you see there in blue, when you hover your mouse over that, it will pop up a, a little window that shows where that link will actually take you. And in this case, the link it's taking to you is sign.refund hyphen IDMSA dot store F. I mean, this is a very suspicious looking address that does not have the word Apple in it at all. And this is one of the surest giveaways. Anytime that a link is not transparently going to the place where you expect it to go, uh, do not trust that. Now, some of you might use mobile devices primarily. So maybe you have a smartphone or maybe it's a tablet like an iPad. And so you might be saying at this point, how do I hover over a link? Because I don't have a mouse. On a touchscreen, Rather than tapping to click a link, 
you can press and hold on a link and it will give you more information about where it will send you. So in, the, in that case, if you have a mobile device, um, you can actually, well, click, but not click, press and hold to get more info. So without a mouse to hover, that is an option. And it's also true that this email has a prompt at the top to translate the text from Hungarian. This seems unusual. If Gmail is automatically detecting Hungarian content, maybe this message came from someone with a Hungarian computer, not Apple. And it's also true that this email does contain spelling mistakes. Legitimate emails from major providers do not have mistakes like this. They have people who are paid to proofread these things. They pay for things like spell check software. However, someone running a sort of a scam operation uh, in an overseas country where people do not like English as their second or third or fourth language, or maybe they don't even speak English and they're using translators. These situations lead to very frequent grammatical and spelling mistakes. And they're on display here in this email. Now, that is one kind of phishing attack and one that impersonates a corporation or an institution. These are probably the most common ones that you'll receive. However, sometimes you can get phishing attacks that appear to come from a personal connection. Very often this happens when someone's email account or maybe their Facebook account is hacked. And once it's compromised, their entire list of contacts, so everyone they've ever sent an email to or received an email from, is exposed in a list and then what will often happen is all of those people get an email so in this case bob smith you know my my colleague taz who this was sent to taz actually knew bob bob's a real person and she got an email from bob wink wink bob <laughs> it's uh it's not really bob but it at least impersonates him because he had his email account compromised. So this email to Taz says, thanks for responding. I'm sorry for bothering you with this email. I need to get Google Play gift cards for my niece. It's her birthday, but I can't do this now because my knees are giving me problems as well. I am going up and down one step at a time. This method is neither graceful, exclamation mark, or fast, exclamation mark. Gosh, I, I do love reading these sometimes. And I tried purchasing online, but unfortunately, no luck with that. Can you get it from any store around you? I'll pay back. Kindly let me know if you can handle this. So this is, again, a fake email. Even though Bob Smith is a real person, in this case, the email address is not one that is actually Bob Smith's. Email addresses are usually like mailing addresses in that they don't change often. And if they do, chances are somebody told you at some point. I remember one time when uh, my father switched internet providers from Bell to Rogers, sorry, Rogers to Bell. He lost his Rogers email address. And this was a big thing to have to change. And he had to let everyone know. So for Bob to change his email address usually would require some communication about this. It's also true that this email sounds very generic. So it says my niece, but it doesn't name the niece. For all, you know, if you know Bob personally, maybe Bob doesn't even have a niece. And again, the grammar is incorrect. <laughs> this method is neither fast, exclamation mark, or graceful, exclamation mark. These things um, affect the flow and on closer reading should make you question things. Now, that's not to say that there aren't some cases where maybe incorrect grammar might not be enough. Maybe you have a friend who is living with a diagnosis of dementia. Maybe you have a friend who has who's sending an email in English and English is their third language. So you can't just figure something out based on tone alone. You need to get a whole picture of the email. So there, there's not just grammar, but also the generic sounding. And 
here's a good rule that I have for everyone. Um, family and friends don't trade Bitcoin or gift cards. Okay. And so if you have family and you have friends, don't trade Bitcoin or gift cards. It's kind of like, uh, I remember as you know, like being a child, every year for my birthday, people that didn't live near me, like one set of my grandparents and I had an aunt and an uncle, I would get a check with my birthday card. And it was always a check. It was never cash because one of those basic rules is you don't send cash in the mail. So that's, that's a, a piece of inherited common wisdom that we all understand. Well, let me also say that you don't trade Bitcoin or gift cards in between family members just willy-nilly. Um, certainly not by email. Like if you want to phone someone up, if you want to go to the go to Shoppers Drug Mart and go to that little wall with all the funny gift cards and then mail someone a gift card, sure. But just online interactions where you say send say via email to send me a gift card. This is bad the way sending cash in the mail is bad. It invites unnecessary risk. So just financial favors are more appropriate for a phone conversation and not an email. Now, if you get an email like this from an account that you know is not really Bob, um, the first thing to do is actually report this as phishing to your email provider. Well, to be fair, if you have Bob's number, the first thing you should do is call him. Um, if there's anything that looks like a personal breach from someone you know and care about, reach out to them, let them know what's happening, and then report the scam as phishing. This allows them to improve their phishing filters and cut off any sort of unwanted attention or attack before uh, it can get out of hand. And you can also block the senders that send these things to you. You see here the way that you can go through those steps in Gmail. So in the, the basic Gmail window, at the top right-hand corner, there is a three-dot menu, sometimes called a hamburger menu because of the three layers. And in there, you can see there's options to block a person or to report spam or report phishing. In this case, you'd want to report phishing and then block that email address. Uh, if you are using Microsoft Outlook, there's ways that you can do this as well. So on the top of the screen, you can report and report it as phishing or as junk. Uh, so it's not just on one system. And you can also do the same thing through Apple Mail. If you do have a friend that is compromised in this way, uh, you shouldn't just tell them, hey, something's wrong. Now that you are all going to be the pros after this workshop, you should actually tell your friend to change their passwords and to warn other friends in their circle about the potential scam. So you want to make sure that this, um, this is one of those things, scams like this hate daylight. So the more open and honest you can be, the more you can communicate that something bad has happened, uh, the quicker you can sort of flush out the negativity of that. Now, what are some of the things that you can do to actually prevent this? Um, first of all, just ignore communications from unknown contacts. If somebody reaches out to you for the first time and it seems suspicious, it probably is. Now, if it is legitimate, they'll probably try to reach out to you again, maybe through a different means. Um, but if, if it's, uh, if it looks and smells a little strange, then it probably is. As we were saying already, uh, watch out for this idea of urgency or, uh, immediate action that's required. In fact, you almost want to build a reverse urgency detector in. So instead, whenever you feel something urgent, that should almost be a sign that something is wrong rather than that this is something you should immediately respond to, you want to plan for, or by default, not engage. And that kind of non-engagement actually includes um, 
just ignoring things. When it comes to receiving spam messages, one of the things that you might want to do is unsubscribe from that. However, in order to unsubscribe from something, you have to click a link. And like we said earlier, clicking links themselves is, uh, it's not something you should do. So the only messages that you should actually unsubscribe from is something that you yourself remember subscribing to. And I give the example because I have done it of subscribing to a newsletter from an online store in order to get the 10 or 15% discount when I sign up for the newsletter. I get that discount and then I know I will get a newsletter. Then I, I feel comfortable unsubscribing from that. But if it looks like some other communication that you can't remember signing up for, just delete and or block. Also, mark spam emails as such so that email filters can get better and better. Whether it's Microsoft, Apple, or Google, these major email providers all have filters in their system that stop the majority of emails from ever even getting to your inbox. And the more you report spam as such, the better they get at recognizing those things. Um, it's also true that if you have an antivirus software, it's a good idea to keep that updated. And um, like we were saying earlier, you can verify a hyperlink by hovering. Uh, that's another one of those good tips. And here's another thing that, that sort of can help you understand whether a communication looks legitimate or not. Reputable organizations will never ask you for your personal information through email or text. Now, that's a little strange because you might think to yourself, well, I have been in communication maybe with a bank or maybe when I was signing up for uh, you know, some sort of service like registering for a bill, I did have to provide some of my personal information to prove who I am. And that's fair, but I can assure you that whenever that happened, you were the person that reached out to the organization. So if I want to ask my bank a question and I phone up the bank, which in my case is TD, I will call from my phone, say who I am, and then they'll say, okay, just to verify your identity, you know, your date of birth, your address, uh, different pieces of information like that. However, I initiated that communication. So if the call is coming the other way, so whether this is a text, whether this is a phone call, or whether this is an email, if they, the, the organization, initiates the contact with me, they will not ask you for your information. And if uh, you get a communication that comes to you, like an email, and you think, oh, well, maybe, maybe this actually is real, but I'm on the fence. I wonder how I can verify. Well, verify with a phone number or an email address that you find through your own means. Not the email address in the suspic suspicious message, not the phone number that's in the text they send, Use contact information from a verified website. Or if it's a phone number, one of the things that I always think, like if it's a service that, that you use and you have a card for them in your wallet, check the actual card. So if it looks like a communication from your bank, just hang up. Just don't answer the email and call the number on the back of your card. But it's not just for banks. Maybe you have a CAA membership and you get a call from them. Maybe um, it's Amazon that's reaching out to you and you have an account, but you don't remember this email in particular. Don't respond to that email. Go directly to amazon.ca and look for contact us, the contact us page. So that, that's because in those emails, very often what you would have to do is, is click on a link or call a number that they put in that might not be a legitimate number. 
And maybe, maybe the email is a legitimate one and you're just really hypersensitive, or maybe you forgot that you ordered something, whatever that might be. If you then go to their website and try to confirm, the worst that can happen is that you're proven wrong. <laughs> uh, and that's fine. So being overly sensitive and being uh, aware of those things is not a bad thing. So let's think about how to avoid phishing by reviewing this FedEx email that, uh, that has sort of a before and after. There is, on the one hand, an illegitimate one, and on the other hand, a legitimate one. So this FedEx delivery alert for a missed delivery. Uh, I'll spoil it in advance. This is a phishing attempt. So it says FedEx attempted a delivery for shipment. The signature cannot be collected at the time of delivery. And our priority is the safety and well-being of our customers. You can reschedule for delivery online via an electronic copy of the shipping label or by visiting your nearest FedEx location. A printed copy of the shipping label and a valid government-issued identification card will be required. Well, so some of the things that you notice about this or that I notice about this, first of all, are that it is generic. So it doesn't actually have the name of the person in the body of the email. And uh, there are not many, but there are in fact typos in this. Shipment has two Ps. Also, uh, while not attempting to be overly urgent, it does suggest that, oh, you missed something, better watch out or you'll lose your package. And they're pushing you towards printing out a copy of the shipping label. They're saying that you need to have that to get your package. Hmm. Not for any package I've ever received in the past. If you have your ID, they already know who you are, FedEx. And so you just need to prove who you are to get your package. It also doesn't say where you can go to pick it up. Like it's really vague on those details. And if you're really sharp, you might notice that that logo is not on brand. That's not the right colors for a FedEx package or sorry, a FedEx logo. This, however, is, this is a legitimate communication from FedEx. And you see here, when you see like a legitimate example, oh, just how much more there is going on. So this has not only a statement about the, that there is a shipment, it has things like estimated delivery date. It has in the body of the, the email, the name, so it has Tasneem Diamond as the recipient, and it has a proper FedEx logo. This is a very, let's say, elaborate, uh, personalized email. And the address up at the top, FedEx Canada at FedEx.com. What do we have on that last one? Ooh, delivray-fedex.com. <laughs> It sounds so fancy, We, it, you know, it's not delivery, it's delivery. But this is a, a made up website that's not just FedEx.com. So uh, a bad website there and a legitimate real website here, FedEx.com is where that email is coming from. This is the trustworthy one. This is the very information rich personalized uh, document. And this is a generic one that should by uh, by the end of today, like be the thing that gets your hackles up, gets you sniffing around. Now, one other thing that you can check if you're worried maybe that uh, after seeing this presentation, you think, oh gosh, I think I have clicked on some of those things. I wish I'd known this six months ago. I, I might have just sent something to Bob Smith because it seemed like a real email. And now I'm questioning whether it was real or not. This is a link that I'm going to get my uh, my colleague Ishman just to, to put in chat so that you can click on this if you want. This is the one case where I say that a spelling mistake in an email in a website is acceptable. <laughs> because you look at this and you'd say, oh, wait, should that be have I been owned dot com? No, th that P really is supposed to be there. This is a kind of online Internet gamer speak to be pwned because you'll notice O and P are right next to each other on the keyboard. 
But what haveibeenpwned.com is, is a registry uh, of all known publicly available data breaches. And I think many people would be surprised to see just how many of their accounts are in these. Because this website ha has a record of, oh, I think it's something like nine billion different accounts. I mean, it is it is a truly staggering number of different security breaches. Um, so sometimes you might have one website where there were a hundred million accounts on it. And if your email address is associated with any of these breaches, it very well could be that some of your personal credentials have been compromised. And if they're out there online, everything that you use that uh, email address with the same password for could be at risk. And so I myself, several years ago, was a victim of this. There was a, a breach from uh, through Bell Mobility. Uh, and I had left Bell a couple of years before this hack even happened. But nevertheless, they still had my information on file. And so my username and password from my Bell account ended up online. And that very often is how the, the attacks, like the personal attacks start, where they'll get your information from a data breach, a big one, and then try to see, oh, there's a username and password here. Uh, maybe that person used the same username and password somewhere else, and they'll try to get at your email and then continue to behave badly after that. Now, just for a couple of minutes before I start responding to questions, I want to highlight some of the things that are really in the last, let's say, six to 12 months, consuming the news cycle when it comes to technology and possibilities and technology and future dangers. And that's how artificial intelligence can sometimes or can realistically affect things like phishing scams. See, artificial intelligence it has tools like ChatGPT, Pictori, and Murph, and they can quickly generate things like images, written text, but also generated voices, um, full-on documents, or make websites. And that content can be used for scams or other illicit activities. And this is already happening. So some of the ways that I'll admit right now, probably 80% of the scams that I'm seeing still look bad. You know, they've got the typos, the poor formatting, the bad graphics, but they are, they're only getting smarter. So it's tricky for, uh, for us to also think we need to get smarter too. When it comes to writing things, malicious actors can use AI to generate realistic emails. And that could help scammers who have trouble with English or French. So for example, just look at this professional seeming email that was drafted from a simple text prompt. So if you put into a, a, an AI chat bot this, write a very short email to someone named Bill, in which you're trying to convince them to send you their email credentials. And then this email was written and it's actually like a remarkably well thought out sort of kind imploring email that looks like it's addressed to Bill. Now it still is just generic in many ways, but it doesn't have the typos, the bad grammar, and it's the sort of thing that is more and more worrying um, for people that do security research. And admittedly, if you just rely on the bad spelling to recognize whether an email is real or not, this would certainly trick you because it's very well written. I mean, I'd give that guy an office job. Probably wouldn't, get, wouldn't work out very well for me, though. And in the same way that it can make text better, it can also make graphics better. So what you see here um, is an example of images that can just be created. So look, there, the prompt was just high quality corporate logo suitable for a bank or utility company without text. And so these little pictures here actually look like legitimate organizational, you know, you could pay a graphic designer to make those logos. It looks legitimate. If it's a picture of a building, so somebody just put in the type or the, the text prompt, 
modern architectural building with aluminum curtain, walking indoors, photorealistic. Boom. That could look like it's a real corporate headquarters of somebody you need to talk to, except the image is a fake one generated by AI. Um, it can be, at times, images generated of people as well. So if you have photos available online that aren't protected, it's very easy for someone to take them as training samples for making new AI pictures like this. So Joe Biden, but really strong and on a beach wearing sunglasses, having fun. And, you know, maybe that kind of muscle is what Joe Biden really has under his shirt, but I doubt it. And, uh, well, I, I doubt those are, you know, I know these pictures are not the real ones because this, these again are just AI created images. It's, a, it's amazing that this uh, can look so photorealistic like that based on just a simple text prompt. And finally, just to note that sometimes these things can affect voices as well. So AI-driven voice generators have actually made phone scams harder to identify because with enough samples taken from a voice recording or the voice track, the audio track of a video, it is possible for a scammer to use a real person's voice to read out text. So this is a, something that currently has only progressed to um, sort of one-way messages. There are no conversations that can happen. So if you were to ever get an unusual voicemail, like imagine getting a voicemail that sounded just like it was from your son or daughter that said, hey mom, I locked myself out of my email account and I need $250 for rent like right now. Can you send it to my new account at this address? If you were to get a voicemail that just had that, you might be inclined to send. But now this is the sort of thing, this is the world we're living in, where if you were to get that message, you would need to phone back and speak to um, the person and ask them questions that only they would know. Um, because things like that, as soon as they're asking for a different email address, mm, very suspicious. So again, just to wrap this up, you, you want to verify everything in terms of being suspicious of any unexpected, uncharacteristic, or unrealistic inbound communication. And that's true whether it's of old school scams or newer ones. There are some situations in which the poor quality of a scam lets you realize something's fishy, but with AI, these can still be, they can be higher quality things, although the tactics will be there. Watch out for panic, fear, or other forms of generating urgency. So uh, that concludes the, the discussion that I want to have about what you can look for. And just now I'm going to, to go to the questions that we have. Benedict, I know you've been watching these. Any uh, any particular ones that jump out at you requiring yeah, answering? We do. We do have quite a few great questions. I mean, there were two regarding Facebook because people, I think you mentioned a lot of emails coming directly to them or text messages. And they're asking, can this come via Facebook Messenger or can you get scammed on Facebook? People are a little bit worried about these social media tools. Absolutely. Uh, you can get scammed through Facebook Messenger. And it is um, it happens in a lot of the same ways that email can. So communication often will impersonate a, a loved one or a friend. I suspect many of you have faced this where someone you know reaches out, but the communication is out of character. And maybe they're asking for money or whatever it is. And then you learn after the fact that, um, that someone's account has been hacked. So reaching someone's Facebook profile to then contact all of their contacts and try to scam you is an extremely common tactic. And one of the reasons why it is seen as more effective is because you have those pictures of your friends. You have the memories that's, that often are real or now with AI could be manufactured to look real. Um, so although I've been saying email and text and, and other things, Facebook is very much a vector for these same kinds of scams.
Great. We also have two questions regarding websites. So uh, one person, Wynn, is asking, do scammers also use websites that are prefixed with HTTPS dot slash slash? Yes. And then, yes. Okay. I'll let you start with that. <laughs> so so that, that HTTPS represents, so it's a hypertext transfer protocol is what it stands for, but it's a secured one. So there's a certain level of encryption that happens uh, on an HTTPS website. However, a scammer can still build an illegitimate HTTPS website. The concern with HTTP websites is that the traffic in between you and that site is less secure because it doesn't have that the security, like that, that S part. And so the the encryption doesn't make it um, more or less trustworthy for the content of the website. It just makes the communication in between you and the site more secure. So you could be eavesdropped on more easily if there's no S. Does that make sense? It does. It really does. Okay. And then we had a, a, a question from Yasmin kind of around the same topic about what about downloading something from a site that you think is legit? And like, I guess, how do you know if that site is legit at this point? Um, so one of the first things about that is it, like, if you think it's legit, uh, do it. And I give the example of, let's say it's recipe cards like PDFs or um, let's say you like to cross stitch or you use a cricket scrapbooking tool and there are program like downloadable things you want for that. If you're going to the website yourself, that's the first sign that it's trustworthy. If you're being asked to download something, that's much more mm, concerning. Yeah, I, I get my hackles up, I guess, in those cases but you can still download things. And once you download things, in most cases, there are ways in which your computer uh, can scan those particular items. So for example, on a Windows computer, their antivirus program is called Defender. And so you would then use Windows Defender to scan any downloaded files before you open them. Great. And someone is uh, asking, is it okay if I send over a Google website checker? It's a simple way to check if a website is safe. So oh, I guess that was uh, that was me. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was Hi. just yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't think I you was could... wondering if what what you meant by is it okay to send? <laughs> um, Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to add to what Jesse was saying because um, there's a um, it's like not exactly foolproof, but uh, I can send over the link. It's um, just, you can just insert like the URL and it kind of tells you if it's at danger, if there's any viruses, stuff like that. I want to clear that with you guys first. I see. Yeah, absolutely. Please do share the tool. Sorry, I, I did not see, <laughs> did not look at who was sending the message. Um, one question that was that came through was about VPNs. Using a VPN or encryption for added protection, what's your opinion on that? Um... I, well, this is tricky. I think VPNs are great, although I'll admit I don't have one myself right now. I've used them in the, in the past. So VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. And this is a, a system um, that in simplest terms takes your online presence and bounces it through a whole bunch of different um, points around the world to confuse the whoever you're dealing with on the other end of a digital interaction, it confuses them as to where you are and masks some of your other personal information as well. So especially for um, for websites that might track you in ways like for targeted ads, this it really affects their ability to track you. So VPNs usually have more to do with digital privacy uh, than digital safety, but also those two can be connected in lots of ways. So there are different kinds of encryption. It's, it's tricky, um, all of the things that go into that. And um, I admit when I have used a VPN in the past, it is because, it, or it has been for 
privacy concerns rather than security ones, although there are certainly security benefits to it. Um, so that's a choice that everyone can make for themselves um, because there are sometimes also some hiccups caused by using VPN. Usually, um, any time that you increase security, you usually decrease convenience in some way or usability. So th those things go back and forth and there's a constant negotiation that every person has to make for themselves in between those things. I see. Does that have an impact? Because uh, someone named Connie is asking, why do some websites refuse to connect or ban my IP address? Could, is this related to having yeah. VPN? Um, yes and no. Um, because what a VPN does is one of the main things is confuse where your location is. And one of the main reasons that IP addresses get banned from certain websites uh, is that your IP address is associated with a particular physical location. And so there may be particular websites that are banned in your country. Uh, and that doesn't mean because it's criminal or anything. That could be something as simple as copyrighted content. So there's a website that has a licensing deal for a TV show for American subscribers. But you as a Canadian cannot access that website. And the way it knows you're in Canada is because of the location of your IP address. So a VPN could fool that by making it you, them think that you're in Akron, Ohio. Um, and that's sort of how the, the, the VPN and blocking goes together because it's usually a geolocation that's at play in those blocks. Great. And it's almost time, but I have one more question for you if you uh, have a, a minute, which is mm -hmm. what happens when you report um, an email as a phishing or suspicious email? You know, you forward it to your bank, for instance, or whatever. Do the scammers get notified in any way? Or when you block someone through Facebook, is there any way for the person who tried to scam you to know that I, you did that? Um, so... Not with the initial block. Now, if let's say it's a Facebook account and enough people report that account, that account could be shut down. But there, if it's just one instance, like there's no immediate notification that that person has been blocked or, or added to a list. Um, decisions are usually made on like aggregating multiple data points. Great. Um, and then we had a question about scams on YouTube, which I assume is the same answer as your answer for scams on Facebook. They can manifest through different platforms. Yeah. The, the big thing with YouTube is there are so many links to click there. And you're clicking links, clicking links for watch a video, watch a video. All of a sudden, the link that you're clicking is in a comment underneath. And you can get worn down getting used to clicking those things. But sometimes that malicious link can be right in a comment underneath. So um, yeah, click on the videos, but uh, sometimes even those comments, if it's sending you to an external site, I would hesitate. Great. And I see Rayanne has turned her camera on. I think it's time to end the session. <laughs> Thank you um, for that great presentation. It was uh, very informative. I know I learned, uh, we always learn, I think, uh, tips as we go through these presentations all the time, as, even as many times as we do them. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm just going to have to skip through your slides. Um, and also, you know, this is uh, Fraud Prevention Month as well. So um, this the, the timing of this is really, uh, really great as well. I'm not sure why that's not going. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to slip through these. Oh, well, we can see it now. So okay. Oh, so can, um, so there thank you again for 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 that presentation and also for all the great questions that everybody posed today. Um, there's it's, there's always so much to to learn, especially with all the new technology and AI that you were giving examples of is is a little bit scary and trying to keep track of that is uh, for everybody is is a learning curve. I think right now. Um, but in keeping in that theme and our connection with and partnering with Connected Canadians, we are doing another uh, webinar on April 4th on increasing uh, digital and financial literacy. 
So if you have uh, other ideas or questions that you want to bring forward uh, for that presentation, you may want to write them down after this and, and sign up for the next webinar um, that we are hosting um, with the Connected Canadians. And I believe Jesse will also be providing that presentation as well. So um, thank you again for taking the time to, to join us uh, again for our sessions. Just lastly, we do appreciate everyone's feedback. Um, after the session ends, we would encourage you to uh, just fill out that survey. That would be great. And if you want to connect with Benedict or uh, myself, our contact information is here. You can also find us on social media channels, um, on our websites, and here's our, our emails uh, as well. Um, and we are gearing up for World Obese Awareness Day, on, uh, which is on June 15th, which is the weekend, but we are in the midst of planning a national forum. So please stay tuned for further details. So there's lots of information coming out soon. And we have many other webinars planned for um, April as well. So thank you all. And thank you for um, Jesse again and to our ASL interpreters for joining us. And especially for those who have joined us today and taken time out of their schedules to learn a little bit more about preventing phishing scams. So have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone.